When a man is going into the ring, he's going to war. Marvin Hagler. Better get your popcorn and your beers and find your seat real quick because this fight don't necessarily have to go 12 rounds because I'm out there to rip his head off. I got H-U-R-T written in my mind. That means I'm going to destruct and destroy. The golden era is the most glorious time in boxing history. A time of great champions whose legacy is indivisible. A time of epic rivalry, pure talent, and real courage. It was a time of the fabulous four. Today we'll tell the story of a legendary person. The boxing ring was not just a competition ground for him. It was a battlefield. His credo is war. And he is the god of his element. His name is Marvelous Marvin Hagler. Marvin Nathaniel Hagler was born on May 23, 1954. He was the eldest of six children raised by a single mother. Marvin was a reserved and very distrustful child. He spent all his free time in solitude. His family lived in Newark, New Jersey. It was a poor and totally unpromising city whose residents felt harassed and disrespected by authorities. This led to protests in 1967 which were termed as the Newark Riots. The National Guard put down the revolt in four days. The city was occupied by tanks and other military equipment. Many residents lost their houses, and the Hagler family was one of them. These events had a direct bearing on the character formation of the former boxer. He saw for the first time the injustice of the system, and also realized that kindness must necessarily come with fists. Otherwise, it's worthless. In search of a peaceful life, Ida May moved her children to Brockton, Massachusetts. This is the hometown of legendary Rocky Marciano. Here began the glorious journey of another legend. When Marvin was 14, he got an occasion to learn the fighting arts. He was beaten up by a guy named Dornell Wigfall, who was a boxer. Hagler swore that he would get even with his abuser someday. It was not just emotions, because the very next day the determined young man went to the gym. There he found people who unlocked his potential and helped him to reach heights he had never dreamed of. Brothers Pat and Goody Petronelli have dedicated their lives to boxing, but fame came to the brothers only with the appearance of Marvin Hagler in the boxing gym. Their inseparable trio went through all the stages of Marvin's development, from no one's prospect to the greatest middleweight in boxing history. Hagler began to learn the art of boxing. For him, it was indeed an art. The first days in the gym, he only watched how others trained, looked closely, and learned the movements. When Marvin returned home, he would stand in front of the mirror and practice shadow boxing for a long time. Training in front of a mirror was Hagler's main exercise throughout his career. Came in the next day, he sat down, he was watching. I was in the ring one day and I just looked over at him. I said, hey kid, you want to learn how to fight? There is no pity for newcomers in boxing. Every coach puts a rookie against an already solid fighter to determine if the guy has character. Hagler had the same story. In his first sparring session, he got a bad beating from an experienced boxer. It looks for certain things in a, in a fighter. Uh, one, number one, uh, uh, does he have the chin and does he have heart? Those two things uh, a trainer can't give a fighter. They generally have it, they don't have it. He, he had all these things. He had a cut lip for a bloody nose and come back the next day. My guy, bloody nose, my lip all swollen. I go home, my mother says to me, she says, Mom, I never forget you. Are you sure this is what you want to do? I say, yeah, ma, I'm going to get this guy tomorrow. Hagler was a fast learner. He had a clear perception of boxing from a young age. He understood the essence of every single move. Marvin could not wait to compete in tournaments. At the age of 16, 
He altered his birth date and his documents to compete as an adult. Hagler even worked construction for the Petronellis to make ends meet. He needed to support his family. That's what prevented Marvin getting famous at the amateur level. Hagler goes pro with a record of 52 wins, 43 by knockout, and with only two losses. He goes in search of glory and greatness. In 1973, Marvin Hagler made his professional debut. He adopted the nickname The Marvelous and dreamed of becoming a dominant middleweight champion, like his idol Carlos Monson. Mad Dog Johnny Baldwin thinks he's tough, but Marvelous Marv is twice as rough. My lightning right hand will score as will. My dynamite left will make the kill. Another step towards the middleweight crown. Get ready, Monzon, cause you're going down. All right. If you've ever tried to research Hagler's early fights, you've always had a problem with finding records. There simply aren't any. Unlike Duran and Leonard, who were promoted at every turn, Hagler was not of interest to promoters. That's why no one tried to save the fight records of an unknown guy. It's a terrible omission in boxing history. It was during this time that Marvin had his first major combat. In his fourth fight, he faced the undefeated Dornell Wigfall, the same guy who had once beaten him on the street. For Hagler, it was the moment of long-awaited reckoning. Marvin won by decision. Two years later, there was a rematch, and this time, Hagler knocked him out in the sixth round. The victories piled up, but there was no progress in his career. Time after time, Hagler was ranked in fights, but boxing organizations didn't look at him as a contender. In those fights where he could have deserved such status, he was stomped by subjective decisions. 1976 was the worst year of his career. The famous Philadelphia tour could make him a title contender, but instead, Marvin lost decisions to Bobby Watts and Willie Monroe. The defeat to Monroe was accepted with honor, but Watts's victory angered not only Hagler, but also fans of Watts himself. The decision was booed and the ring was thrown with coins in protest. In the morning, the local newspaper published an article with the headline, Welcome to Philadelphia, Marvin Hagler. The boxer now realized that climbing to the top would be more difficult than he had hoped. In my view, it was the perfect conditions for the rise of prime Marvin Hagler. Perhaps without those setbacks, he would never have gotten to be so great. Understanding that he was facing not only opponents, but also the boxing elite made him angry, starving, and determined. Joe Fraser once said something to you a long sure. time ago that you had three strikes against you. Three strikes Can you tell me about them? One was that I was black, second one that I was a southpaw, the third one that I was good. <laughs> he was right, wasn't he? Yes, he was right. One could blame Hagler's entourage for these difficulties. The Petronelli brothers really weren't businessmen. They had no influence in the boxing world, but they knew how to grow a true champion. Marvin appreciated everything they had done for him. When someone suggested changing teams, he rejected the offer without hesitation. All he had to do was follow the thorny path of the Petronelli brothers. Marvin's perseverance was truly inevitable. After two defeats, he has built a 20-win streak. Hagler cleared the way to the title. He won almost every fight by knockout. He paid off Willie Monroe twice and took a rematch for the draw to Olympic champion Sugar Ray Seals. The victim of the ferocious Hagler was the father of the future legend Roy Jones Sr. He also beat Benny Briscoe. Eugene Hart, and undefeated prospect Mike Colbert. At 162, the fighters had agreed to a 162 minimum, and Seals is down. Seals now will just try to get himself back together from that tough right hook from Marvin Hagler.
while back on the last round. On November 30th, 1979, Marvin clashed against the holder of two titles, Vito Antuo Fermo. Hagler had almost 50 fights on his record, and just now he's got a title shot. It's hard to imagine what other boxers had such a long, laborious path to test himself at the championship level. Marvelous was under pressure before the fight. He believed if he didn't beat Vito, he would never get a title chance again. Fortunately, Hagler was a wizard of mental auto-suggestion. Vito the Mosquito, man must fall. What decision was against Vito Moro? Under 30 seconds to go in round one. Go straight hands for Tommy Hagler. It was a marvelous performance by Hagler, appropriately his nickname. He was effortless, unpredictable, and varied. Credit must be given to the champion's tenacity and courage. He missed countless uppercuts, counter straights, and other punches. And Tuo Fermo was competitive in some episodes. But the big picture was clear. Hagler should have been world champion. It's hard to describe how it feels for a fighter who spent years of his life trying to earn a chance, but in the end has been robbed once again. When the decision was announced, it upset me so much that I went back behind the stands and threw up in a garbage can because we just didn't do right that night. You can't leave it up to the referee and you can't leave it up to the judges. There's only one way to do it, is to do it my way. Boxing is the best reflection of what is going on in life. The fighting journey is filled with hardship and injustice. Perhaps boxing is the most corrupt sport in existence. Like politics, boxing has calculations and scripts that clearly did not include Marvin Hagler. But an example from his childhood always reminded him of what to do when you don't get the credit you deserve. Before the Antuo Fermo fight, Hagler was boxing but now his fighting ideology is war, whose slogan is destruction and destroy. This is my judge right here, my bidders. If you want to bet on this, this is K and this is O. Attempts to get Vito a rematch were not successful, but justice was served. Antuo Fermo lost twice to Alan Minter and said goodbye to the belts. Hagler, meanwhile, revenged his controversial defeat to Bobby Watts and brutally smashed other contenders. Hagler got a second chance. In September 1980, Marvelous went to England to fight Minter. 
Formally, the match was held on the champion's territory, but as soon as the bell sounded, Allen understood the battlefield didn't belong to him. Marvin destroyed Minter in three rounds, but he looked very graceful in the role of such a formidable executioner. The thing is, Hagler learned ballet. It was part of a training program to develop lightness and plasticity, and even with such powerful muscles, he retained those qualities. His cat-like leaping ability and devastating power made for a killer combination. This is the moment he's been waiting for. Marvin Hagler is the world champion. Instead of celebrating his victory, the fighter had to flee the ring from angry, hysterical fans. They hurled bottles and other objects at him. It was a real mess. That was the end of the 54th fight of Hagler's professional career. Was it a difficult road? I think the numbers answer that question eloquently. Marvelous Marvin had a unique fighting style, combining different tactics, drawing on the best he saw from his opponents, and creating fighting moves using the eight typical proportions of his body. The fighter's genetics are impressive. He has extremely long arms and long legs in comparison to his torso. He also has a very powerful head. Scientists have concluded that Marvin Hagler's head has more powerful muscles than any average athlete's head creating a football helmet effect. Perhaps this is why Marvin Hagler is the most durable boxer in history. No one has ever truly managed to knock him down. The only knockdown he has ever been in is a mistaken one. Viewers who don't know much about Marvin can say that he was a great warrior. They give him credit for his physical skills. He is considered a slugger for his ability to find and destroy. But in reality, his style is more complex than it seems at first glance. What he did in the ring is called the art of war. Marvin easily adapted to any opponent. It's all thanks to his excellent distance control. He was aided by his very long arms and agile legs. At 5 feet 8 inches in height, his arm reach was 75 inches. That's the reach of a heavyweight. The champion's footwork deserves special attention. Hagler had no trouble punching while moving, whereas most other boxers need a stable stance to throw a punch. Marvin was right-handed in life, but in the ring, he was famous as a southpaw and a master of switching stances. He never stepped back to change leg positions. He did everything on the move. Here's what it looked like. He would punch his strong hand under the same leg and thus switch positions. He's right-handed again, there we go. Oh, best puncher, oh, the best puncher He could do it twice in one attack. This technique is called a double shift, and it is a difficult part of boxing. Another individual trait of Marvin Hagler is the gazelle punch. In the moment of a short hop, the legs come off the canvas. Coupled with long arms and agile legs, Hagler could easily get an opponent at extra long distance. He used the gazelle punch when he threw the jab. Not many boxers use this technique. It's difficult and risks counterpunching. Hagler was also diligent in his training. He spent hours practicing punches, getting them to the point of automaticity. Some call Hagler a brawler, mistaking his style for a primitive exchange of punches. But Marvin was too smart for such simplicity. His goal was to hit the target, invite a counter, defense, and punch again. In boxing lingo, it's called blow to blow. Hagler created momentum. He made his opponents take risks. 
He was a true grandmaster of this game of quick chess. Hagler's main weapon was his jab. Since he was orthodox, the jab had a special power in a southpaw stance. In his arsenal, there was a double jab, a triple jab, a jump jab, a jab with deviations. In general, it was a versatile weapon, which he could both start and finish the attacking actions. Of all the fabulous four, Marvin Hagler certainly had the best jab. Every offensive success came from simple yet effective actions. Marvin kept his hands at the chin and was ready to block or parry punches. But the best thing he did was head movement and body movement. He was never static. Hagler moved out of the striking zone behind his opponent's front leg. In this way, he slipped off the attacking line and created new angles for his actions. Hagler's boxing style can be analyzed at length, but to describe it in three words, it would be variation, unpredictability, and complication. Some boxers prefer to reinvent the wheel and use one weapon for their entire career. It looks boring. It is the kind of fight you don't want to watch again. That's why Marvin Hagler's fights are true masterpieces. A fighter cannot become a god of war without proper training. And a boxer like Hagler trained under Spartan conditions. He had a perfect work ethic. When Marvelous started training camp, he used to say he was going to jail. That's how tough the conditions got. His training lasted six to eight weeks. And for that time, he was isolated from his family. No wife, no children, no strangers at all. He had only the right people by his side, Goody and Pat Petronelli and Hagler's half-brother, Robbie Sims. For the same reason, there are extremely few workout tapes on the web. Marvin rarely allowed the training process to be filmed. He cared about his endurance, so he ran in a variety of conditions. It could be running in the sand in hot weather, or running in the winter in the hellish cold. Hagler even ran alone. Everything he did, the other team members had to do the same. Who's the chair? I'm the chair. Much attention he paid to the boxing school. Already being a famous champion, he kept practicing shadow boxing in front of a mirror so that his muscle memory would copy all the movements. Hagler's sparring sessions were brutal. Oftentimes, they were tougher than many of the fights on modern pay-per-view. There have been some non-standard workouts like ballet. Some fighters practice yoga to get rid of stiffness, but that doesn't give you the lightness and agility that was in Hagler's legs. And all this physical advantage the fighters reinforced by psychological work before each fight. He tuned into the war and never shook his rival's hand, despite all the respect he had for him. Hagler used to say, what's the point of shaking hands with someone you're going to destroy? You know, see what I got on my head. My head says war. That's where my head's at. I'm working to get that mental toughness and I'm working to be physically strong because I've, I realize that this is what I have to do. For years, Marvin has been waiting for a title fight, and he was at the top of the world for a long time. For the next six and a half years, he resembled a tiger that guards his prey and rips apart anyone who comes close. Hagler paid off a controversial draw with Vito Antuofermo, twice beating Mustafa Hamsho, Tony Simpson, and many other contenders. His championship years are characterized by two words, destruct and destroy.
staggered once again. things on my mind. This is for you, Folio Bell. Destruction and destroy. They told me that you were sick last time. I'm going to make sure that you're sick this time. In 1983, Hagler unified the titles and became the first undisputed champion in boxing history in the Three Belts era. Marvin's popularity increased. He was one of the top names on pay-per-view and was already recognized as an outstanding fighter, but not a legend yet. For that, a legend had to be defeated. Therefore, Hagler accepted with honor the challenge of Roberto Duran who came in at middleweight. Marvelous Marvin scored the biggest win of his career at the time and got the long-awaited recognition. From that moment on, he became the leader of Pound for Pound. Any champion can boast of a sporting legacy. But not every fighter can proudly claim to have fought in battles that have become something immortal and epic like the Trojan War. No matter how many years have passed, boxing fans will never forget the dramatic thriller in Manila and the marvelous fight of the century. Ask any fan about the most brutal fights and in the top three will be the war by Tommy Hearns and Marvin Hagler. The fight didn't need any promotion. At that point, both Hagler and Hearns had achieved iconic status, but the press tour did happen and the rival animosity reached a fever pitch. That belt by your bed because um... <laughs> Be the last time you see that. Hagler recited a mantra of victory before each fight. It was his way of changing his mental attitude. Marvin was a real master of mental suggestion. Hearns' best uh, defense is his offense because that's the only way that he knows how to fight. Uh, in my way, I had to make my defense my best offense. So, uh, and though that I have both ways because once I get him in trouble, I can change it around. Thomas don't have that ability. I have my mind focused on one thing, and that's to destroy him. That is to knock him out. If I have the opportunity, if it's there, I'm going to take it. That's what I feel. War. That's what's on my mind. I've been feeding the faith, and I've been starving the doubt. So there's no doubt in my mind that I can't win this fight, or that I won't knock down the turn down. I'm going to knock him out. I mean it. I'm going to knock him out. 
I'm not here for destruction, I'm here to destroy. Now, obey my command at all times. Shake hands, good luck for both It wasn't just a boxing match, it was eight minutes of rage. The best fight of the year, the best first round in history, and maybe the best fight in history. It was a war, and Marvin Hagler could proudly claim that he had scored a brilliant victory. Demanding and very practical spectators loved Marvin Hagler for one simple reason, by purchasing a ticket to the fight they received an unofficial guarantee. Everyone knew they would get what they paid for. If Hagler promised a war, then everyone had to bring raincoats, otherwise they'd get bloody. If he promised destruction, then especially sensitive persons should not come to the event. And that guarantee was Hagler's words. He made such threatening speeches in a quiet, calm voice. I feel very strong, very confident, I'm ready to hurt somebody, and that's what I mean. I'm ready to hurt somebody. I'm kind of tired of all this talk and everything. I'm just going to tell you this. I'm going to knock him out. That's all it is to it, and that's the bottom line. I'm going to knock him out, and he will not be the beast no more. And this man, I will end his career for him. I will feast on the beast come March 10th. John Mugabe, nicknamed The Beast, was not the most famous, but one of Hagler's strongest opponents. This victory can hardly be overrated. Roberto Duran once took the soul of Devi Moore, just as Marvin Hagler knocked The Beast out of John Mugabe. He was defeated and destroyed. Marvelous pondered retiring after beating Hearns and Mugabe. Maybe he should have. 
Eventually, he lost the quality on which his style was based, its light, agile footwork. But there was one rival that Marvin wanted to fight. Sugar Ray Leonard had always been his main antagonist. In the amateur ring, and for most of his pro career, Hagler had seen how Leonard got the honors and glory, and he wanted to take it away from him. But the moment their fight happened, everything changed dramatically. Hagler no longer needed Leonard. He was king of the ring. He was top of the pound-for-pound -pound list four years in a row. But somewhere in the back of his mind, Hagler retained the desire to prove that he was better than Sugar Ray. In April 1987, a truly magnificent fight happened. Perhaps the most exciting fight in history in terms of stylistic confrontation and boxing skill. A fight that millions of fans waited almost five years for. Leonard did not fight for three years due to vision problems. Hagler was a dominant champion and the best boxer in the world. The predictions were clear, but no one expected that Ray would be so competitive. Sugar Ray's style was the perfect counter to Hagler's actions. Marvin had never before looked so clamped and so monotonous. Against the explosive and unpredictable Leonard, his actions seemed too primitive. For the past four years, Hagler had crushed and smashed everything in his path, and Ray watched from a commentator's position. He'd learned him backwards and forwards. The fight with Leonard was the last chapter in the career of Marvin Hagler, one of the four kings. After retirement, the great champion went to live in Italy, where he tried to become an action movie actor. In 1993, he was included in the International Boxing Hall of Fame. Multiple times Hagler has been recognized as Fighter of the Year. Boxing Illustrated magazine named him the Boxer of the Decade, and according to many, he is the best middleweight to ever step into a boxing ring. One day, a 14-year-old boy came to the gym to learn self-defense, but he fell in love with boxing. He mastered the art and became the god of war. Marvelous Marvin Hagler is like a single man who goes against the system. Whatever the circumstances, he could proudly say, I made it. I got to the top. Marvin Hagler always wanted to be a role model. He used to say, Champions are made when no one is watching. Feed the faith and starve the doubt, and then you will succeed. <laughs>